I'm Stephanie Lemick, and this is Building Trauma-Informed Workplaces. I am so excited to have another amazing guest joining us today. Sam Maureen McGregor is the author of the book, Leader Awakened, and I am thrilled to talk more about the book and talk more about her work. Um, welcome, Sam Maureen, and I would love to have you introduce yourself to our listeners. Thank you, Stephanie, and it's so nice to be here today. Uh, we clearly connect on on a very important issue, uh, so it's it's a real pleasure. Uh, well, I'm Sam Marie McGregor, and uh, just a, a brief a brief bit of background. So I, I've got a particular passion in helping people, leaders, but people generally, uh, to understand the the gift that adversity presents for us for learning about ourselves and about how to best navigate quite a challenging backdrop that that I think we find ourselves in and uh, you know moments in history where backdrops haven't been challenging but it certainly does feel fairly unprecedented certainly the access we have to information and connection with one another and it's a bit paradoxical it we are more connected than ever yet I think as humans we are more disconnected than ever so uh, yes trauma informed workplaces are, are something really important to me I've uh, worked for over 25 years as a consultant and a coach. Uh, very recently, over the last five, five or so years, I've been working predominantly with executive teams and C-suite leaders. And uh, I often get that question of why, why them? And 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 there is there is a very specific answer in 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 my view. And and I guess my experience would suggest that leaders do have a disproportionate impact on people, on culture, on organizational behavior, on society. And therefore, given I'm getting older and I've got kids and I've got a life that that you know that I need to sort of balance things across, I yeah, I want I want to find the needle in the haystack and I want to to really help uh you know change some of these important conditions. Oh, I love that. I'm somehow even more excited for our conversation now. I don't even know how that's possible. <laughs> I'm so excited. So I would love to get started and talk more about your phenomenal book, The Leader Awakened. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write the book. Oh, well, I love that question because it was it was an important choice, really. And I think um, choices are are something that perhaps it's been later in my life that I've realized, it, you know, we, we, we do have the ability to make choices and, and choosing to write a book isn't, isn't an easy one. It's uh, certainly a commitment that doesn't, doesn't come without effort or pain or a distortion to, to the life around me. Um, and I look, it, it was a, it was a really interesting moment. I, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the content, but I had gone through a fairly turbulent period as a, as a woman, as a professional, as a mother. And so had my family, my, my son um, had an unexpected illness. He was diagnosed with a brain tumor when he was nine years old. And I, back in my own professional context, was in a great place. I was building my business. I was really excited about the prospects. And and then this happened. And so there was a bit of a crossroads of what's the trajectory that I thought I was on and how am I going to... Well, I guess in that early time, I, I didn't even ask myself the how. You just, you know, I, I, I jumped into tigress mode and protected my my child both my children actually and um and our family and then a period of a couple of years went by thankfully my son was you know he survived he's been very healthy since generally speaking and um and yes we sort of got back on track if that makes sense and it's a very strange and simplistic way of putting it but um and then not long after that the the pandemic hit but coming back to your question, it was in the middle of all that, that mess uh, of me trying to piece myself back together again, um, mainly professionally and also sort of socially and just just the, the, the sort of post-traumatic period. And I was 
really lucky to get a very cool role in an organization within a big corporate where I led a team of, of, of leadership coaches. Um, it was an external team. And then I worked across the organization to support leaders uh, as the business was going through a major digital transformation, but a 31 billion pound uh, joint venture as well. So it was, hu- it was just a, like a, it was it was an enormous multiple set of, of factors and 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 contexts and I learned so much because although I'd coached for many years and I'd consulted for many years, I was typically on the margins of an organization coming in, being on the outside, and this time I was in it. <laughs> so the combination of those two experiences plus the pandemic, which I think we share, we all share having gone through uh it was it was just my consciousness was ripe with inspiration and a need and one need actually a few needs one need was catharsis it was a bit of I have lost a lot I hadn't quite realized how much um I've also gained a lot and I've learned a lot and I've grown a lot and a part of this process is for me actually I need to write it down and see if I can make sense of it and learn from it even more and then there's a I'd actually think quite a few people would find this quite an interesting journey to to learn from I love that it's so powerful and like you said writing is it's a lot it's a it's a journey it's disruptive it's also you know a real pouring of yourself out on the page, especially in the way you've written your book. And so it can be a really vulnerable Mm. moment as well. But I love what you say in that this is something that others can really, you know, appreciate or benefit from as well. So to that end, I'd love to know, you know, when you think about the perfect person to pick up your, who is your ideal reader? I mean, that's such an important question because I um early on in the process I did speak to quite a few people and um one woman I spoke to who's an editor and she did actually support me in editing and and guiding me through the process of writing the book um and and also she one of the other things that she she was she was very good at doing was taking really comp because if you think about it it's quite sort of emotional and complex and sometimes dark content and checking it and saying for the reader that you've got in mind how palatable is this going to be how indica in, you know how how translatable is it how relatable is it going to be and so that was the first question she asked me she said so who's it for and it took me quite a few days to 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 although initially i thought about it and I, it came to me quite quickly but it took me quite a few days to chew the fat on it because Actually, I want it to be for anyone. I genuinely want it anyone to read it. But when you're writing a book, it's really important to anchor it in that relatability criteria. So initially what I did is I wrote it for a leader in a corporate context or a leader in an organization or in some sort of community-based setting where there are clear intentions and the leader is living the realities of life and has an aspiration to fulfill and make contributions in line with their intentions and I wanted them to see the whole of the systemic context that they live within but I initially also when I started writing as you can probably imagine I I went down various avenues you know the dark trauma and the horrible story and you know, let's let's face it some people don't really want to read a story like that because it's quite painful and it's quite overwhelming um the really pragmatic stuff that's slightly theoretical but trend-based that enables someone to make sense of themselves in their own context and and then there was the me it was the actually I have always learned through my training through my I feel that in the work that I do if I can't model the shifts, the challenges I put upon myself and the courage, then how could I expect my clients to do that? 
So that that was the audience, but the process to write that had ver various avenues. And in the end, I think I actually combined all of them. It's so wonderful because automatically when you're creating something, you want you want it to be for everyone. It's kind of this, uh, you know, you want everyone to be able to find something, but I love how you also thought very deliberately around how this book, how this information could support specific people while also also having that openness. And, and I do agree, anyone can pick up this book and get something out of this. But I also agree, you know, this is going to be on my list when leaders are asking, you know, what's a great book for me to leverage? Like, oh, I have one for you. Here, here's something that you can take with you, you know, something very meaningful, but also something you can take action on in your day to day. Leaders, especially, mm. don't have a lot of time. So being able to take something and really apply it is super meaningful as well. It is. And I think one thing, Stephanie, it's really interesting with that because it's been, I guess I've done a lot of leadership training and development as well. And in the past, actually, not 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 recently as much. I've done in fact, I'm doing something soon coming up. And I was grappling with this question of how much because I guess I guess one of the premises of, of what I'm encouraging leaders to do is to do that deep introspective work and also to look at their context systemically so it's both there's an internal there's an external and there's a bridge between the two that are re it's really important to be able to, to to travel between these aspects and there's more by the way because in the internal there's the embodied versus the cognitive so there's loads of different dimensions there but that all sounds very conceptual and abstract. And someone like you, I guess, from what, you know, our connection with it and the way you've connected with the book, has it resonates. But sometimes I'm finding that in the current context, with such a task focus, an accelerated pace of life, as you say, people are busy. It's really easy to be seduced by the need for a list of things I should go and do. What are the top 10 things or what's the first three steps? And 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 interesting, when I was writing the book, I was like, should I be putting that kind of stuff in there? Should I not? You know, and, and it was really hard because actually it goes against some of the deep introspective work if you just give a very quick list. Um, equally, it's got to be pragmatic and it's got to be something that people can re relate to and do something about. And doing includes taking a walk and thinking and contemplating. That's an action. It, it has been a bit of a tension, I must admit, um, to get that right. So it really does support me when I hear your response to it from that angle. I love that tension because I think, you know, as someone who spent 16 years in corporate HR, when you give a list, when you give tasks, there are many people who just cross the task off their list. And they are doers and they are achieving and getting things done. And they've been rewarded for behaving in that way. So when you just provide, provide a list of things to do, you might not get exactly what you're hoping for. And I mean, maybe it's the time of year, but this is one that comes up for me so often. And, and perhaps many people can relate. Performance reviews. Yeah. Here is this conversation that you want to be very reflective, introspective for individuals, really meaningful. And so often, because it's a task to check off a list, it becomes just that. And, mm -hmm. it, and mm -hmm. it misses out on so much meaning, so much importance. So I love how you found that balance between, you know, here are things you can go and do, but also find the time, find the space, the introspection, the space, the time is really the task, um, yeah. which is hard for people, but it's it's a worthy challenge. It's worthwhile for mm. sure as well. Mm, agreed. So to that point, where do you recommend leaders start their journey to better understand how their trauma or trauma responses are showing up for them at work? And this is one for me that I find so interesting because it's my my own journey with trauma-informed workplaces really started with understanding how my trauma responses were showing up for me. Oh, wow. Okay. Gosh, that's 
That's that's great to hear that you're on that inquiry cycle as well. Well, look, there's and and again, I think we're we're on that pendulum between theory, concept, or unconscious, subconscious, and conscious. Yeah. So and 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 therein lies, I think, the direction I want to encourage people to 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 play with. I'm learning more and more that in the workplace snap judgments are made uh assumptions er erroneous assumptions about either the intention the capability or the motives of people that we interact with and these moments these moments of time tend to be the currency of how things get done and how relationships get built and how outcomes are sub optimal and so my curiosity over the last seven, eight years and, and longer, I think, I've, I mean, I've, I've been on this journey understanding this longer than the severe trauma I experienced very recently. But I would say, and I am going to tell you a little story, um, but I would say that it's about being far more curious. And I know people say this, but far more able to slow down a bit and take the time to understand what are the assumptions upon which we are relating to one another. Um, if you take that to an individual level, you know, what are those obsessive behaviors I'm finding myself doing repetitively? And I'm sleepwalking through life, continuing them. What are those disproportionate reactions I'm seeing myself have or someone else is having in relationship with me? What's a what's that about? Where is it coming from? Because if you reflect, and I'm reflecting myself on moments where things haven't quite gone my way, or I've been a bit frustrated, or I've been working with a colleague, or someone's let me down, I have a choice. I can say, oh, gosh, if only they could, you know. Or I could say, what role am I playing in this? What, what, what is, you know, what, what is the opportunity here for us to work some of this out? And and then below that, below the surface, if that's just the task and the relationship above the surface, below the surface, what's driving their behaviors, their actions, what might be the pattern that's keeping them disappointing me? And what's the same for me? What's what's going on? So I'm going to give you a little, just to make this really practical, because um, I have been thinking about the story a lot. And um, it is a very personal story. You will have picked up bits of it in the book it's it's a story about my relationship with my dad in the book I talk about how he encouraged us to only speak English at home it was more than encouraged actually it was beyond that but um and I was by the way and I just for the listeners but I I, I grew up in Venezuela my father's from India both my my mum and dad um met in the U.S. actually uh, they went to Stanford together. Amazing stories. That's a whole other set of stories and their traumas associated with that. And the intergenerational trauma that I'm sure is, you know, part of that, that fabric. But he had this really typical, I, I was going to give it a word and I'm trying to dissociate it from my response to it. Um, he used the word stupid a lot and he used it towards me. And it was, it was, really consistent um often many times a day when I look back on it now I think oh well, you know that's a bit trivial you know like why would that affect me but as a child it it became it became a word that got woven into the tapestry and 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 actually it was it was like a a dark shadow that that followed my milestones yeah um, now, to make this super, super um, pragmatic and see how it expresses itself in my professional life. And you can then extrapolate this in, in, in other facets like relationships and things. But but my professional in the workplace, you know, I had this it, and I remember, in fact, it was my dad who made me realize this as well. This pattern that was born in my relationship at home as a child to this word this very specific word, and then how it also manifested in some of my relationships with people I really respected, with male bosses earlier in my career, um, with clients who I felt were powerful. And the manifestation for me was, I really wanted to impress them. 
And by the way, I can still catch myself doing this now. So it's it's deeply rooted this, right? And I realize after a lot of introspective work and dialogue with various, you know, mentors and, you know, other practitioners as well as therapists and coaches, my supervisor, that it may be a response or a reaction to me not wanting to be stupid or inadequate. And so what, what, what I've noticed happen is, you know, I would, I would seek out relationships of people I really revered for their intellect, for what I could learn from them. And then I desperately seek their recognition. And I would do everything to perform and fulfill their expectations actually often exceed their expectations. And the more positive feedback I'd get, the more I'd seek out the relationships and the work situations. Now, this is a very, this is only one. And, you know, we, we're all multifaceted and we've got lots. I mean, this is definitely a core one. And, and you know, it would manifest in lots of different ways as well. But the, the other part of that, just, just to finish the story is, I, I think about how that manifested with my clients, you know, more recently in the last 10 years, but previously when I had bosses. And then I've always thought, I've really thought about how as a parent, I don't transmit that same intergenerational pattern to my own kids. So, you know, to take it to the extreme, I have spoken to my kids about this, you know, stupid is taboo at home, you know, and and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a joke, but, you know, if anything like that is used or referred to, you know, I really encourage us all to be mindful about it because I've caught myself doing it, not towards them, but in a context where I thought, hang on, that's funny because I've had that reaction and I'm now using that terminology or, and so breaking that chain is just as important as breaking my own in my relationships. I love that. That is such a powerful story. And I think for a variety of reasons, but think about how often we reflect on, you know, our childhoods, especially, and something can seem so trivial as an adult, you know, you're dealing with these big things and something so trivial, but it stays with you. And I would share, I'm, I'm sure you would share as well, is, is don't ignore those things that may seem trivial that keep coming up for you because there's something there. And the experiences of childhood, and when we talk about childhood experiences and how they shape us, and there's so much work that goes into this and adverse childhood experiences, and even just, you know, those smaller things that shape who we are have this huge weighty impact on us because of how we're developing. But it can be so easy to say, oh, you know, that that was, you know, part of my childhood, but it doesn't matter anymore. It's showing up for you because I would say the same thing. You know, my childhood experiences were shaping my responses and my reactions and showing up for me at work in ways where I'm like, why am I behaving this way? It doesn't make sense, but it's ingrained in who we are. And to your point, the power you create and recognizing that for yourself and then also choosing to do something different mm. is beautiful. That also can have impacts on for example, your your family, your children, the impacts on all of those around us as well. In our so relationship you know, work. Yeah. Yes, 100%. And so it can feel really trivial, but if something keeps coming up, it's important to recognize like why? Why is this coming up for me? And really exploring that. And, and you know, this is a great place to, you know, do that introspective work to partner with you know, a therapist to help you kind of unravel those things. They can be really kind of buried deep in there. Um, but it's so powerful to really understand and interrogate what, why does this keep coming up for me? And, and that's the question. It's why is this coming up for me? And it might, it might be really difficult to recognize for some people, by the way. I think there's some legitimate reasons why, and I know you, I, I would imagine that you're very aware of this because of your trauma-informed work and your passion around it, but 
But, you know, I think, you know, there's two things that you've said there. One is a childhood piece, which I'm very, uh, as you know, I'm very inspired by Dr. Gabor Mate, who has written several, several books on addictions. He would actually started his career in palliative care. Uh, he's actually a physician, so he's a doctor. So there's quite a lot of credibility that comes with what what, what he's learned and, and how he expresses it. But he's also done a lot of work with ADHD and trauma. And his recent book, it's called The Myth of Trauma. And I, I'm, I mean, I actually read it after having written this book, but um, he, he also had written a book called um, When the Body Says No. And um, really powerful stuff about childhood and how he mentions four different he calls them expectations. Um, he plays a little bit and says, you know, infants are narcissists by just by nature, because we have we have these expectations when we're infants. You know, the first is unconditional love, yeah, and presence, you know, of of the parent or multiple guardians actually. The second he talks about is having the freedom to express my emotions, especially anger and fear where if you if you reflect back on when we're children it's not very convenient for a child to be expressing anger or fear is it um the other the other thing he talks about is not having a child not having to work for the love they receive yeah and then the last one is you know wild play out in nature and you know he he, he juxtaposes that with uh with gadgets and, and things in, in in current living but so that's one thing and i think you know actually he ex extrapolates a bit but I'm compelled by it that some of those conditions or preconditions that are missing for many kids lead to traumatic experience later on in life because of the lack of presence or the the fact that they have to work for people for their, their parents love and all that sort of stuff because we're all so busy and so that's the first thing the second thing I just wanted to say was more about you know um the the the, the way in which we make sense of our own that specific question you said which is you know why is this coming up for me why is it coming up for me again and and there is a dichotomy between what's unconscious and perhaps what's subconscious and then what's conscious so the assumption is that we would be fully conscious about it took me years to realize the stupid correlation or cause and effect yeah I would say I feel intuitively it is a cause and effect connection. And so some of the, con the, 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 the approaches and practices I'm using now to help me do that, to be, again, to answer your question is, you know, breath work, um, you know, plant medicine, things that help me get into that altered state of consciousness to truly access what is it that's going on there that my head, my mind has no conscious access to. And some of that is necessary some of that's really needed to truly access some of it. Absolutely. It really is. And I mean, for me personally, one thing that came up and it took me years to recognize was yelling. Uh -huh. And yelling for me triggered. I I, I am very much a stand up for what I believe in, very much, you know, willing to go against the grain um, and challenge people, which is important and also very difficult in an HR role. Um, but mm. when someone would yell, it would cause me to kind of shut down and then move towards, you know, placating someone like, oh, how can I make this right? How can I just get you to stop being angry at me? And it was because, and, and I didn't figure this out on my own, and I think that that's what's so important, is I had help from my therapist. It wasn't because, I was like, why am I doing this? This doesn't make any sense. This isn't who I am. But it's because that was a learned behavior. You know, when I was growing up, yelling was common. And, you know, when you're little, yelling is, you just want it to stop. So how can I get this yelling to stop? And it's by, you know, shutting down all of those confrontational behaviors. And so I had learned that. And having someone point that out to me, I don't know if I would have ever recognized that myself. But having someone point that out to me helped me find a way to move past that. And it can be as simple as for me, if, if someone's yelling, the conversation stops. 
until someone can kind of move forward so I can kind of return to my normal state, my normal self. Yet of receiving that that boundary for me and, and being able to respect boundaries for others as well. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that story because my son's got a very similar response to yelling. And, um, you know, and it could be anything. It could just be, you know, his sister shouting at him or husband and I raising our voices a bit. But it it literally triggers him. And he's mm-hmm. only, you know, 15 now, 16, actually. He turned 16 two weeks ago. I've forgotten. Um, and, you know, and he has very, very similar reaction. And yeah. we're working through that right now. And, you know, the, the, the I guess the, um, well, the privilege that he has is that we talk about this. And yes. when it happens we try to understand what is it that he needs in that moment and encourage him to set some of those boundaries. But, but, you know, when I hear your story, it takes me back to other similar moments in my life where I just had no, no one to talk to about that in the moment. We don't, we don't, and we still don't, by the way, I just happen to be in a field where my kids, unfortunately for them at times we over speak about this stuff. But yes, I think I think that's the really, and the I think the only other thing I wanted to say on this is um, the legitimate reasons why people don't engage with the learning that comes from traumatic experience. There's you know there's stigma. Okay, it's dark. It's oh, it's, you know, and actually there's is, you know in some cultures it's it's taboo or seen as a weakness. Uh, I think we as humans have really clever adaptations using developing and using defense mechanisms like denial and avoidance and dissociation, that amazing capacity that we have to numb feelings we don't want to feel, like you placating because that was an ability for you to, to you know, to turn down the dial on something you didn't want to feel. And, um, and not having to relive uh, the painful experience. So these, and, and then there's a normalization of things, you know, if, if, for example, um, in a particular context, it was normalized um, that people yelled or communicated with, with you know, highly emotional and unregulated interactions, then the normal reaction you'd have to that would be just to recoil. Yes. And that normalization in itself makes it hard to connect your need or your unsatisfied need with the behavior that you're having to employ to protect yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love what you said, Sam Marine, about some people are are not wanting to talk about trauma or trauma mm-hmm. feels dark or taboo. When I first started my work, I was encouraged by a lot of people to not call it trauma-informed workplaces. And I struggled with that because I recognized what they were saying, that it's taboo. People are uncomfortable with talking about trauma, about talking about prevalence of trauma or our own experiences. And at the heart of it, I said, you know, this is what it is. Yeah. It isn't something else. It, it isn't a different term. I can appreciate the allure, but at the heart of it, it's what it is. And I would rather do the work to help people talk about and normalize trauma and what it means to be trauma informed mm. than to kind of skirt around the issue. Because I think it, it you miss out on so much when you yeah. don't acknowledge what it really is. Absolutely. No, I'm, I'm really encouraged by you saying that. And admittedly, when I was thinking about the title of my book, I didn't use the word trauma because I didn't want people to not read it as a result of that stigma. Uh, so my solution was to talk about it in the first chapter, as you can see, <laughs> but not allow the book cover to stop them. Um, right. But like you, it's got to be named and embraced. Yeah, it's, it, it is. It, it has to be named. It has to be embraced. And I'm I'm heartened because I think the tide is turning. I think especially the younger generations are much more comfortable talking about trauma. But I think normalizing the conversation for all of us is so powerful. Um, and, and that's where, you know, I'm really excited and encouraged by my work is that even if someone's not ready 
to talk about their trauma, to recognize their own trauma, the work we all do to be more trauma-informed. So one of the things that's so important when we think about trauma-informed or trauma recovery is the concept of resilience. So I would love to hear from you, you know, how can we build more resilience in the face of prior trauma and adversity? Yeah, it's it's such an important, uh, an important direction and a need. And and I guess there's just as a bit of context, you know, I'm really aware that society tends to encourage and celebrate resilience when it's seen. And there isn't enough space, time, or capability to acknowledge the suffering that's taken place to cultivate that resilience. So I think one of, well, my sense is that one of the first steps is to acknowledge that and to notice that there is a relationship between those experiences that live perhaps consciously or less consciously in our shadows and the time and space needed and the compassion, the lack of judgment or the a move from judgment to curiosity to truly understand what makes up resilience. Because resilience doesn't just doesn't just happen. You know, a, a, an infant born into the world isn't fully resist, resilient, rather. Mm-hmm. The infant, for some of the reasons I shared that, Doug, that Dr. Gabor Mate beautifully expresses and everything else that goes on in life is built through all those experiences and adversities that the child goes through as they learn and grow. And therefore, we need an understanding and a conscious, embodied understanding of what resilience is made up of. And part of that is, I mean, not always suffering. I don't want to, you know, over-dramatize it. But, but you know, the, it, it's a skill. It's a capacity. It's a, it's a resource. And to build those three or and more awareness, seeing where it came from, being open and courageous to accept the pain that comes with it enables us to then truly embrace what what comes, the strength and the fortitude that comes as a result of it. Absolutely. I love how you frame that. We so often, you know, say, oh, look how resilient this person is and and kind of laud resilience. And we don't reflect on what it takes to get there and the suffering and those bad, those bad experiences that make up resilience for someone. I think that reflection is so powerful because it's it's a journey. Resilience is not automatic. And I think sometimes it's like, hey, be more resilient. Like, that doesn't help be more resilient. You know, the supports, the tools, the working through our experience is what helps us gain that perspective, gain that resilience over time. Yeah. And, and, you know, a lovely analogy for that is, you know, when, when, um, when I used to teach my kids and, and I was certainly influenced by my own parents who were highly protective and my mother's Latin American, my dad's, you know, we had, I definitely, from a cultural perspective, they were, and, and I'm making a correlation here, but I did, from the real experience, they were quite protective, right? And I, I remember being with other kids and now as a mother seeing other children when they, my kids are now teenagers, but you know, when, when they were younger, I guess the equivalent now is going to be when they're going out and doing things, you know, that, 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 that teenagers do. But it's that tolerance for ambiguity and that tolerance for allowing the child to make the mistakes. And, you know, if the child is overprotected all the time, their learning is undermined by a lack of experience. So resilience... I feel has a similar rhythm to it. You know, if we don't have the experience, we won't truly understand why we need the fortitude to overcome challenges. 100%. An example of it similar that I often reflect on is, you know, people always can say, oh, you know, go ahead and try and fail. It's okay to fail. And I oftentimes want to remind people, it's okay to fail if it's safe to fail. Mm-hmm. If there is a safety net, if there is 
something that says you will be still safe despite your failure. And for many people, that is not the case or that hasn't been the case for them, especially when you think about those childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's learned, that there is no safety in failure. So that advice, again, and there's that nuance of our how our experience shows up and then kind of shapes how we have relationships, how we show up at work. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in a workplace, just to make it really sort of grounded in that, what you're saying there is is just so spot on, you know, it, on both resilience and, and failing safely is expecting people to be resilient or expecting people to go out and, you know, I'm coming in to fail um, without truly appreciating the conditions required for someone to fail and to celebrate the learning that comes from that to actually put that equal to the lack of achievement is extremely important because it reframes yes. everything. But many organizations, because, and this is where my compassion for senior leaders are, um, their shareholders, expectations in the market, competitive um, reality, but also just the backdrop of constant socio-political, economic, environmental pressures makes it very difficult for an organization, its leadership, to, to truly, you know, saying, okay, let's all fail, is one thing, but taking the space and time to say, we're going to learn from this, despite the expectations we need to meet for our shareholders and the profits, we need to make sure that we recover from last year's losses, you know, for whatever uh, reason, you know, we can, we can start with the pandemic, but there's a lot, you know, lots of other reasons currently is really hard. It's really, really hard. So, you know, that's why taking a systemic issue and noticing the relationships between these various dimensions is so important absolutely absolutely well we have someone on the podcast who has a decades of experience working with senior leaders so i would be remiss if i didn't ask this next question so transitioning to leadership can be incredibly difficult mm -hmm. and stressful and it's often not supported as much by organizations as we'd really like to see or really should be what is your advice to navigating the transition for those who have experienced it recently or may, may be experiencing it in the near future? Oh, gosh, that's such a topical question as well, because I'm noticing myself get quite a few inquiries to support the development of managers um, into leadership or management managers into, you know, from being very comfortable in their technical expertise and then playing a far broader, more strategic role. And it, it has formed part of my work over the years, but I'm noticing this is a need that keeps coming up. Um, and it, it, the conditions are, are they different? They're just more magnified, you know, so the level of volatility is higher. The level of, of expectations are growing. And I would say for managers or people transitioning into that senior position, and 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 we'll talk about hierarchy in a minute, but you know, are are surrounded by conditions that 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 make that transition slightly more complicated and slightly more, you know, messy. Um, and I think something that you said earlier, you know, the, just the, the support needed and the duty of the organization in creating those conditions is a prerequisite or they are prerequisites and they're not always there. So for me, and I'm going to touch on things that we've already talked about, it's how does the person going through this transition appreciate and acknowledge what they know and those parts of the work they do and the contribution they make and whatever they participate that they can rely on through familiarity. But, the more expansive aspects of their new role are far more focused on getting more out of others, empowering people, working with insufficient answers, having to confront challenges that are potentially unpredictable and unexpected. And actually now we're moving away from that familiarity and into a space of making it up as I go along. 
So that transition requires space, time, a bit of confidence boosting, a bit of reaffirmation that little experiments that I do and failure is to come back to failure are necessary to lead when so much is out of my direct sphere of control and influence. So spot on. And I love, I love that you brought up control. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm maybe having a little bit of a light bulb moment myself is mm -hmm. you're releasing so much control or you should be releasing so much control when it comes to moving into a management or leadership role. And for so many of us, that control or illusion of control is really something we cling to. And there can be a lot of reasons we do that. But for many, it may be related to previous experiences of trauma. The more we can control, the more we feel we're, you know, in control of our environment, the more safe or secure mm -hmm. we feel. But again, that that's an illusion um, in, in most scenarios. So I love love that reference to control because I think that that is really key and gets to a lot of the challenges of management is that, you know, release of, of control. Yeah. And it's such a paradox because I think in an environment where and in corporate context where we are expected to be accountable for results, control becomes the only currency that we can use to play you know, and to hold and to, and, and, and as you say, it is an illusion. And it's interesting, you're, you're, you're connecting with trauma, because I hadn't, I hadn't even gone there in this conversation. But, you know, the stories of the past, and the, again, some of the emotional baggage that comes from the past, particularly around control, starts to get magnified, it starts to deregulate us, and it starts to make us feel even less in control. Um, high accountabilities and expectations, low ability to control and low ability to influence. And what happens for someone who's technically very strong and maybe been very successful is they cling to what they know. Mm -hmm. And actually the paradox is letting go and trusting and experimenting and failing so you can build your intuition rapidly in community with others is sits completely at odds with clinging to control and to what I know. And that's really Absolutely. hard. It is. It is. It's so hard. Another question I have for you as you know, an experienced executive coach, how can those who are doing coaching, who are coaches of executives or other individuals, how can they better work to understand trauma how it shows up and maybe work to become a trauma informed coach. So fantastic question. And, and I think such an important one because we are now on a wave. We're definitely, it's not quite a tsunami yet, but there's a wave. Yeah. There's um, what I've been so, you know, cause a lot of my trauma development has come through working with a supervisor who specializes in shame and trauma <laughs> and um, having obviously worked at Ashridge uh, Management College uh, many many years ago this is where the Center for Executive Coaching was born in the UK and we've done a lot of inner work and I also studied psychotherapy and counseling so I've got and neuroscience so I've got I've got a very long history studying various aspects of trauma but now what's wonderful is that there are some actually very good courses that uh, will enable you, and, I, and I've having participated in, in, in one recently, actually, um, as a guinea pig, I just wanted to see what it was like. Um, it enables you to understand or get access to and understand and immerse yourself in the theory, like the neuroscientific stuff, some of the embodied stuff, some of the psychological stuff, and it's really, really, you know, I think we've moved in the last, I would say, five to seven years. We've moved a long way. I mean, I'd be really interested to hear your experience on this because you're actually focusing in on it in, in, in developing these organizations. But we've become far more sophisticated in articulating it and talking about it and working with it. So 
these courses, and by the way, there's so many of them online and good ones, actually, really, really high quality delivery. Um, and I felt just going through content I was already familiar with in the context of this course, in community with others, I was learning stuff about myself and then also about how can I articulate and eloquently bring to the fore for an individual or for a group, because I do a lot of group coaching um, and team coaching and trauma does not, it exists in a very dynamic way in that context, um, how to use some of this content. So I would definitely sign up to a program. I know there's a center for, con there's a, quite a few of them actually. I, I can I can give you a list um, if you want to put them in into the, uh, you know, to the notes of, of this podcast. Perfect. Um, they're global and I'm sure you'll have quite a few locally that I would love to learn about as well. And, 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 and I think learning just literally move, you know, they're not expensive. Some of these courses are really quite cost effective and a great investment. And you learn about yourself and you learn about the content. So that's one thing. The second thing I would say is get yourself a supervisor. I mean, I think if you're doing any coaching and get yourself a supervisor that's trauma informed and extremely curious about that fabric that you and I have been exploring today. Um, I go deep. I go really deep with my supervisor. And then the third thing I would say is try practices. You know, I mentioned breath work earlier. Um, I'm actually going in quite excited about this. I'm doing a breath work practitioner's course this weekend. I know I haven't done anything like this before. I mean, I've participated, but not, you know, to become a practitioner. And and it's a two day course actually in London because um, I live in the UK. And it's, you know, it's it's eight hours each day. It's going to be quite intense. And we just have to bring our yoga mat and water. <laughs> so it's going to be quite interesting. And um, I've done some breath work. Um, and a mini story is that over the summer, I went to this incredible, incredible, if you ever want to talk about this, we can maybe do another podcast, but an incredible festival called the Medicine Festival. And it's, the, so the definition of medicine is, it, well, it's the provocation. It's a question inquiry, which is how can we be the medicine, us as people rather than humans, be the medicine for the environment, for the connections with one another. And this is where it's really interesting is they get indigenous tribe leaders from around the world and wisdom keepers and all sorts of incredible experiences for three well we were there for four days and I went with my 13 year old daughter and it was my first proper experience of breath work with her <laughs> we did it together oh I have goosebumps we have to we have to talk about this sometime. We, we, can. we definitely it's so can. amazing it's a different story but the short part of it which validates my third recommendation is that by doing this work it was interesting we went to a trauma release workshop which was quite a deep one and I I hadn't quite appreciated how deep we were going to go and she went deep really deep I, I didn't I was actually quite conscious and although I did do the work as well and and she cried for hours and this is a girl who at seven years old was fundamentally abandoned for six months while her parents were solely focused on her brother and his survival and I know that sounds a simplistic yet very difficult image, but it genuinely was what happened. And she relived not the actual images, but the emotions came out through the breath work and released them. It was astounding to witness. It is. If, if you are someone who's interested in breath work and you have not tried it, I, the first time I did breath work, it was earlier this year. I was like, mm, I don't know what this is. I'll check it out. Holy bananas. Like <laughs> it is an unbelievable experience. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I hear stories for so many different people and so many different experiences. It is absolutely worth exploring if you have a curiosity around it. And and I think just for, to the logic and the ration behind it, just for those listeners who are uh, either slightly cynical or skeptical, which is totally legitimate and understandable. Um, it, it, there, you know, 
at a very basic level, you're over oxygenating your body, which is enabling you to reach a heightened state of consciousness or an altered state of consciousness, which encourages you to do embodied work rather than thinking or cognitive or rational work and so the ability to release some of those emotions and be with some of those emotions in an altered state of consciousness means that that unlike speaking therapies where it's hard and some of these defense mechanisms i mentioned earlier get in the way it won't get in the way if you if you just breathe it's amazing. Magic. Amazing. Well, we are out of time. I think we could talk for several more hours. Perhaps yeah. we will, it sounds like. I do want to make sure, you know, I'm sure our listeners are intrigued about your work. Obviously, you know, recommend everyone check out your book, Leader Awaken. There is a link to the book in the podcast notes. But Samarine, if there is uh, any other work that you're doing that you want to share with our listeners, or if our listeners want to follow along with you, how can they do that? Well, I think most of the work I do is in the coaching capacity. And um, so so clearly, if you're interested in, in, in making contact, please do. The website is leaderawakened.co.uk, uh, rather, or um, turmericgroup.com, which has got all of our, our different services. And, and on LinkedIn, we are constantly posting bits and pieces and there's lots of other podcasts I'm on and um, I will be speaking at a few events um, over the coming yeah months so keep an eye on that and it's on Instagram as well although we don't really we don't really do much Instagram but we we do repost everything on Instagram if you want to but and that is at leader awakened amazing perfect Samreen thank you so so much for making time to chat with us today what an amazing conversation. What an amazing book. And hopefully we'll be able to have you join us again to talk more. Probably. Until then, um, to all our listeners, thank you and be well. Thank you.